The world is a crazy place, but I am happy to have you joining me on the podcast. I'm Pete Dominic, and I've got two great guests today. Clint Watts is a national security expert. Latasha Brown is a civil rights and voting rights hero. Both joined me. I'm Pete Dominic. It's time to stand up right now. Stand up. Yeah. Hello. Happy Tuesday, if you're listening on Tuesday, whenever you're listening. Happy day. Happy day, human being listening to this podcast. I am very happy to have you joining me here today. We had a horrible massacre, another shooting, the second in a week in America, which means we're returning back to normal. This horrible, horrific, uh, unimaginable nightmare that is mass shooting violence that takes place really nowhere else in the civilized world. But we love our guns. That's America. And again, in Colorado, where we saw, of course, uh, it began with the school shootings, Columbine and Aurora in that theater. And now at a grocery store in Boulder, Colorado, I have two very close friends in Boulder, Colorado, reached out to both of them, and they are safe. But horrible tragedy in Boulder, and I'll play some clips for you on that. It happened later in the day. I didn't certainly talk about it with either of my guests who joined me. But I will say this, a good day in the shed yesterday, or today, as I'm recording this at like past midnight, a great day in the shed in that I got to interview Clint Watts and Latasha Brown. Clint's become a friend. He's a national security expert. He's always a great guest and awesome analyst. But I've never talked to Latasha Brown, and I've been trying to get her on the show. We've been going back and forth off and on. It's been my fault. I dropped the ball. But I've been trying to get her on the show for a while. And most of you are probably familiar with Stacey Abrams, who is the one, the, the woman who gets the most credit. But a huge team and movement of activists, including my friend Frank, uh, who I've got to get uh, play hit my interview with him. You know, so many people up and down in Georgia that should get credit for the special election in the in the Georgia Senate, which changed the planet. Frankly, I mean, there's no way to 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 talk about and to give enough context and and credibility to how much of a difference it means. No matter what you think, I mean, if you're a QAnon conservative or an Antifa leftist, you have to uh, admit that Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff winning the Georgia special election and throwing the Senate majority to the Democrats with a Democrat president, Democratic president, is massive. It's a huge, huge, major, major triumph for climate change, for uh, saving democracy in this country. And one of the people most important in this is Latasha Brown. I first learned of her work when reading uh, Tiffany Cross's great book. Tiffany, who is a friend who hosts a show on MSNBC, uh, has touted Latasha Brown's activism for a long time. But you hear Stacey Abrams, you should also hear the name Latasha Brown. She's on the show today, and she's awesome. What a wonderful, interesting, moving, and at times very funny conversation. And I'm so, so excited for you to hear it. If you can't hear it in my voice, I'm just in a good space. Even though we have this tragedy and even though there are horrible things happening in the world, so happy to have you listening, and I think you're really going to like those interviews. Okay, now it is time to get to the news here on the podcast, Stand Up Daily. Every day I start with a robust news segment. Yesterday I asked you on the podcast what you thought about the news segment and the overwhelming feedback, like 10 emails from listeners telling me, which is a lot, I'm so happy, thank you, to, to, to those who listen and actually then email the feedback. Overwhelmingly love the news segment here that I cover, except for Joe in Florida. Joe in Florida is like, it could be a little, uh, it could be a little shorter. <laughs> love you, Joe. I love Joe. But overwhelmingly, you loved it. So let's get to it, shall we? The last 24 hours in news. I'd say for the last 24 hours, you've seen the news zeitgeist shift. And it was mostly focused on what is happening at our southern border and then, then immediately shifted, as it does, to a mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado. Those were the, the kind of two big stories. And I got some sound clips, sound bites for you here on this. But I think that it's always great to speak with anybody from Connecticut. Specifically, Chris Murphy is fantastic. He's a senator who I admire uh, a great deal, who wrote a book 
uh, about gun violence. Of course, he is a senator from the state where Sandy Hook happened. Chris Hayes had him on his show on MSNBC last night. And I want to play their back and forth for you first, because I think this is one of the best things, at least that I saw. I'm sure there was a lot of great pieces of commentary, a lot of good stuff on social media. But I like Senator Chris Murphy. Here he is on All In on MSNBC with Chris Hayes last night, where he makes a great and important observation that not all gun violence is equal. You've got gang crime. You've got crimes of passion. You've got mass shootings, of course, suicides. And he addresses that with nuance. There are two phenomena that track rates of gun violence. One is poverty. Uh, the more poverty that exists in a neighborhood, the more uh, they are going to be likely the victims of gun violence. And so it's not coincidence that in 2020, with epidemic levels of economic desperation, you saw more people resort to violence. Second, um, the more guns in a community or a state or a neighborhood, the more gun violence there is. So when you have quick access to a firearm at a moment of, of fury or panic, um, there's more likely to be a shooting and a death. And so 2020 was an awful year for gun violence. Violence. Um, not a lot of mass shootings that captured um, news media attention, but every single day there were hundreds of people dying uh, often, and uh, it can be explained in part um, by the economic crisis of 2020 and these massive numbers of gun sales. Remember, 30% of gun sales aren't even reported because they happen without background checks online or at gun shows, and so you probably had a massive number of illegal guns being trafficked in 2020 as well. Yeah, and one of the things I, 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 I I really liked about your book uh, is that there's some humility in it about what we do know and what we don't. And, and I think there's a lot of puzzling still to do about what we've seen in 2020. But it was a very brutal year for gun violence in this country, to your point. Uh, not necessarily in terms of mass shootings, uh, like the one that we think that we have just seen happen in Boulder, Colorado, where we are awaiting police reports, or like the one that happened uh, at several different locations in Atlanta and outside Atlanta uh, just last week. Uh, but shootings nonetheless, deaths nonetheless, trauma nonetheless. Um, and we are we continue to be a country with more guns than any pure country and more gun violence. Uh, we, we are, and we're also a country that sends uh, an unintended uh, but meaningful message to mass shooters um, of uh, endorsements. I mean, when Congress doesn't do anything um, year after year, decade after decade, in the wake of mass shooting after mass shooting, um, these minds that are starting to become unhinged uh, imply that it's okay. Uh, and so it's not a coincidence that over the last 100 years, the two moments where Congress passed the most meaningful anti-gun violence uh, statutes in the 1930s and the 1990s, there was an immediate precipitous downturn in the rate of violence. Yes, it's because the laws changed, but it's also because the highest level of government sent a signal that we didn't accept this level of carnage in our country. Um, and people took that moral signal and, and changed their behaviors because of it. Uh, my hope is that we'll be able to send that signal again in 2021. Yeah, Senator Chris Murphy from Connecticut on MS. SNBC last night. Now, here's a spokesman for the Boulder Police Department in Boulder, Colorado, who's very folksy and kind and calculated. And I, I didn't get his name, uh, but here he is. Uh, we had a very tragic incident today here at the King Supers. Uh, there was loss of life. We have multiple uh, people who were killed in this incident. And I am sorry to have to report that one of them was a Boulder police officer. During this trying time, I would ask the media and the public to honor the privacy of the officer's family and his uh, co-workers here at the police department. I will also share that we got tremendous support from our fellow law enforcement agencies, both in Boulder County which some of them you see behind me, the FBI, ATF, and other Denver Metro agencies. Without that quick response, we don't know um, if there would have been more loss of life. I can share with the public today, or this, this evening, that there is no ongoing public threat, that we do have a person of interest in custody. That person was injured during the incident and is being treated for the injuries. And because he was a white guy, 
We did not make Swiss cheese of him with uh, uh, 75 guns aimed at him. And we did, of course, take him to the local Boulder Red Lobster before jail. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to make jokes in the wake of such a horrific tragedy out in Boulder, Colorado. The name of one of the victims that I'm seeing is that officer, Officer Eric Talley, who is on the force for, I think, that I heard, uh, 11 years. And just a, a horrific story out of Boulder, Colorado. Lots to say about it in the coming days. So many mass shootings in this country, specifically in Colorado. And the response to this type of attack, it's just so clear to me. It should not be things like more policing in our communities. It should be things like mental health and fixing our broken laws in America. I like this sketch from comedian Walter Masterson. I'm not sure who he, who he collaborates with this, but I think this is a good illustration in terms of a policy, which if we put aside the horrific tragedy and the emotion surrounding it and talk about solutions in terms of policy to violence that includes guns, this is always an interesting Exchange and these two comedians do a great job of illustrating it in this quick sketch, which is a parody of Republican politicians at the state and federal level after every mass shooting. We don't have a problem with guns in our country. We have a problem with mental illness. Okay. Well, do you believe in making mental health care more accessible or more affordable? No, I do not. So even though we're the only developed country where this regularly happens, you don't think there are any gun laws we could put in place to help prevent these shootings? No. Perfect. That's exactly literally what is happening in Congress at the state level as well as the national level. There just aren't any policy solutions to solve gun violence. And by the way, I have been talking and arguing about this issue and learning about the issue of gun violence in America for over 10 years. Doesn't make me necessarily an expert, but I know the arguments. I know a lot about the policy. I know a lot about the constitutional arguments. When I was on the most popular podcast in the history of the world, Joe Rogan's podcast, I argued with him about guns. And just yesterday, I, I had a guy uh, tweet me about that interview. That's how big of a deal that that podcast is. It was over a year ago that I was a guest with Joe. And Joe and I had a great, thoughtful discussion and argument about it. And and I thought it was I thought it was really educational uh, for listeners to hear our discussion but his uh, a lot of his listeners absolutely hate me for that segment on guns nonetheless i'm uh, still try to be informed and educated and not all of gun violence is 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 the same that is for sure i already mentioned that but there are policy solutions that will lessen gun violence and the consequences of gun violence that we could put into effect that I surely believe, you know, who a good person to talk about this is with is or any good people are experts on public health. That's what the Joe Rogan fans. Some of them are still mad that I that I talked about gun violence as a public health issue. Ah, oh, really? I mean, anything that kills you, anything that sickens you is uh, or a, a wide swath of people is a public health health issue. You don't need your masters in public health to understand that. Okay. Done ranting. Uh, that comedian Walter Masterson, I saw that sketch, that parody of the argument Republicans make about funding mental health because I also saw this sketch, which when, which for some reason went viral last night. I'm not sure when he did this interview, where he was, but uh, comedian Walter Masterson, he shows up at a lot of these kind of conservative event events. He was at the January 6th insurrection, as a matter of fact. And he was talking to an anti-masker conspiracy theorist. And I just thought this was mm, chef's kiss good. You can take um, oregano oil. You can dilute 10 drops of oregano oil and drink that over the course of the morning and do that 10 days in a row oh my and your God. covid symptoms will be gone now oh if you're very, I think that's i think that's total fucking bullshit i honestly don't care what you think i don't think you've done your research do you understand how dunning kruger works i don't understand how anything you refer to even makes any sense brother what is that dunning kruger dunning kruger what so, is that so, so like the stupidest people in the room think they're the smartest <laughs> What is your name Dunning Kruger? Like, what are you going to come out with next? Occam's razor? The simplest explanation is that I'm an idiot. Oh, it's so rare that you have a moment so beautiful. Hallelujah. That was 
just so good and so American right there where where we are at. Comedian Walter Masterson on Twitter. Maybe I wonder if he'd be a good interview. I'm going to give him a follow and try to connect with him. All right, now let me pivot, if you will. Please, just let me. Let me move to something different, and that is what is happening on our southern border. Now, conservative Bill Crystal tweeted this. There is no crisis at the border. There's a recurring problem at the border, which is being addressed and which could be considerably ameliorated by a sensible and humane overhaul of our immigration policies and practices. Practices the Trump administration made worse. That's conservative Bill Crystal. And here now is CNN's Jake Tapper uh, turning the screws on Joe Biden's spokeswoman, Jen Psaki, on CNN's The Lead yesterday. I thought this was interesting. Release these images I'm sure you've seen of a migrant overflow facility in Donna, Texas over the weekend. Um, does the president believe that these conditions are acceptable? No, he doesn't. And that's why he wants to move children as quickly as possible out of the Border Patrol facilities. They're not meant for children. And that's why he wants to open more shelters. He wants to increase and expedite processing at the border. And this is an issue he's focused on every single day, Jake. I know the administration is trying to speed up processing at the border, as you just noted. But of course, that takes time. That takes resources. Right now, documents from your own Customs and Border Protection show that some children have been in custody for more than 10 days. The law obviously says 72 hours is the limit as you've just heard from Rosa. So what are you doing right now to, to fix this? Is President Biden perhaps going to ask Congress for emergency funding to help alleviate the conditions there? Well, Jake, I've asked our experts about this. It's less an issue of funding. It's more an issue of needing more facilities and needing to expedite the processing. So you've seen we've uh, announced the uh, the opening of new facilities. We'll announce the opening of more in the coming days and weeks, uh, places where kids can have access to health care, can have access to educational resources, even legal resources. That's one step, but also expediting processing at the border. A lot of these kids, some of these kids, I should say, have phone numbers in their pockets. Uh, the president wants them to be able to, those phone calls to be able to be made to expedite that quickly so that we can get them to safe homes. Those are two of the steps we're taking. A third one, let me just note, is that we're restarting the uh, the program that allows Central American Minors Program that allows kids to apply while they're still in country so they don't make the journey at all. That was something that was ended under President Trump, and we are restarting that program. All right, that interview continues. You can watch it at CNN or at The Lead or whatever you want to do. You don't have to to watch it. I mean, maybe you don't care about the immigration issue. I think a lot about it. I'm going to reach out to some experts on it. It's super complex. It's not easy. Don't fall for the binary arguments about immigration. And most of the people that are coming right now are young people. They're kids. Come on. I mean, make them Americans. Teach them uh, rugged individualism and pro wrestling. Come on. We can, <laughs> I kid America. You guys are American and you're my favorite people. Sorry. All right. So also wanted to share with you the uh, my, my governor, Andrew Cuomo, who's just in uh, <laughs> disgrace at this point. Uh, he was he he's still the governor. He hasn't resigned yet uh, on more allegations against the guy. And yesterday when he was asked by apparently one of his supporters, if he's going to resign, he, he called her darling. He said uh, he's not going anywhere. And he called her darling. I mean, the guy's being accused of sexual harassment by eight women. And what does he do? He calls one of his female supporters darling in front of cameras. And, and that's not sexual harassment. No one's saying that. It's just it is misogyny. I mean, it, 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 who calls a, 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 a woman darling that is under a certain age? I mean, you know, listen, it's not the worst thing in the world. But at this point, you're you should know better. You should know better. He doesn't. And it's ridiculous. Did you hear it? They were like, oh, we love you. And he's like, all right, I'm not going anywhere, darling. Ugh. All right, lots more to play, lots more to say, but I'm out of time. It's late already. I've got two great interviews to share with you. Clint Watts uh, and first Latasha Brown coming up, which I'm so proud of. But let's get to a quick news dump first. Here's another news dump jingle from Pete Co. Flying bat around the room looking for his lunch. Is sharing all its rabies on today's news dump. <laughs> <laughs> I always love the the animal sounds, but sharing all of its rabies. <laughs> 
That really is good. He is funny. And Pete Co. I I'm I'm Pete Co and Dan McDonald are collaborating on some of these. Dan is writing them and, and Pete's recording them, or and some of them Pete's just doing alone. Some of them Dan's just doing alone. And and maybe somebody else wants to get involved. Uh, many of you have written these jingles, but I, I can't keep track of who's contributing to what, but Pete sent me that, and I loved it. All right, now it's time for news headlines, rapid-fire style. It's not politics. It's not COVID. It's the news dump, folks. <laughs> Let's start with an unimportant story, but yet pretty interesting culturally, I guess. This is newser writing. The Parade of Jeopardy guest hosts continues with Katie Couric having just wrapped up a two-week stint. And NFL cornerback Aaron Rodgers on deck for early April. But the host who will show up behind the podium tonight is causing some consternation. Dr. Oz. Yeah, you think? Dr. Oz, please. This guy has been peddling pseudoscience for a while. Not all the time, but too often. And uh, there's... This guy is at way too good of a career. How about Dr. Aaron Carroll or Laura Coates, who Alex Trebek himself said should replace him? How about her? What's going on with Laura? I got to reach out to her and catch up on that. Now, I, speaking of Dr. Aaron Carroll, I shouldn't really cite studies without running them past him. And, and maybe this isn't accurate, but I'm trying to give you permission to have your body uh, changing in a, in, a, in, a, in a negative way, in the wrong way during lockdown. A new study finds lockdown weight gain is real. And so the reason I mention this is because if you're struggling with, with eating and with your weight gain during lockdown, forgive yourself. Now, this is a small study, but it found participants gained an average of 0.6 pounds for every 10 days. I'll ask Dr. Carroll next time I talk to him if he thinks this is a well-executed study. But I just mentioned it'd be like, you know, listen, it, 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 forgive yourself for no matter what you have done basically during this unprecedented time in our lives. I mean, I mean, if you murdered somebody or something, don't forgive yourself for that. But if you ate too much, drank too much, smoked too much, watched too much, didn't exercise enough and things like that, it's okay. It's fine. And you know what else? You're not alone. I mean, I myself have been absolutely perfect. I certainly didn't have Diet Coke and Buffalo Trace whiskey during tonight's news dump. Thank you, listener, subscriber, Carrie Williams, for buying that for me. Okay, here's a crazy story I was following a lot. A gunman hijacked a National Guard caravan transporting COVID vaccines in Texas, according to authorities. An Arizona man was arrested after police say he corralled a convoy of National Guardsmen transporting COVID-19 vaccines to Texas on Monday morning. Guy's 66 years old. He was tailing these National Guard vehicles, three of them, from a gas station and... He made a bunch of attempts to run the caravan off the road. Finally, the the, the National Guard van stopped, and he points a gun at the unarmed National Guardsman, demands to search all the vehicles, insisting he was a detective. And police finally responded, somehow diffused it, uh, found the guy in possession of a loaded pistol and and had two loaded magazines. Nothing, no, no, no gunshots were fired, so it ended... Uh, fairly peacefully, but he was charged with av- aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, unlawful restraint of 11 National Guard soldiers. Imagine being pulled over by a crazy person and you're a National Guardsman. Uh, they couldn't, they didn't fight back. I guess that's a good thing, but you got to see pictures of this guy. He looks exactly like that photo of Saddam Hussein after he was found in the spider hole. And this is what is happening in America. We see these things happening way too often with conspiracy theorists buying into shit and putting their lives on the line for something that isn't happening. ABC News is reporting that more than 1.5 million people streamed through U.S. airport security checkpoints on Sunday, the largest number since the pandemic tightened its grip on the United States more than a year ago. Mark the 11th straight day that the TSA screened more than 1 million people, likely from a combination of spring break travel and more people becoming vaccinated against COVID-19. Passenger traffic, of course, remains far below 2019 levels. I haven't gotten on a plane in well over a year. How about you? All right, I thought this was an important story. The National Weather Service has turbocharged its lagging forecast model to better predict extreme weather events such as hurricanes, blizzards, and downpours, as well as day-to-day weather. By including much higher layers of the atmosphere, increased factoring of ocean waves, and other improvements, the Weather Service's update to its global forecast system trying to catch up with a European weather model that many experts consider superior. Again, 
Uh, that is actually the uh, Associated Press science writer Seth Bornstein reporting that. That's interesting. National Weather Service upgrading its forecast model. Uh, trying to be more accurate. I like that. I like it. It's important. It's very news dump worthy. And what else can I share with you here in the news dump? How about this? Stocks have soared 75% in a historic 12-month run. West Virginia might be the next tax-free haven. Bernie Sanders is lecturing Elon Musk to focus on Earth instead of space. Clint Eastwood is starring in a new film at the age of 90. And Ellen DeGeneres has lost over a million viewers after apologies for creating a toxic workplace. That is it for today's news dump. I've got to get to my first interview of today's episode with someone who I consider a civil rights and voting rights hero. Latasha Brown is an award-winning organizer, philanthropic consultant, political strategist. She's also an, uh, a singer-songwriter, jazz singer with over 20 years of experience working in the nonprofit and philanthropy sectors on a wide variety of issues related to political empowerment, social justice, economic development, leadership development, wealth creation, and civil rights. She's also the co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund, a power-building Southern-based civic engagement organization that played an instrumental role in the 2017 Alabama U.S. Senate race. Latasha Brown is the principal owner of Truth Speaks Consulting Incorporation. She's been a regular guest on MSNBC, CNN, and so much more over the past year. She's a personal hero of mine, and I was so excited to finally get her on the telephone. Here is our talk. She's on Twitter and Instagram at Latasha Brown. Let's do it. I have got her on the phone, and I've been trying to connect with her for a long time because I think she is such an important person in America today. And for a long time, for so many reasons, as I just articulated in the introduction, I'm a little nervous. Ladies and gentlemen, her first time on Stand Up, Miss Latasha Brown, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Congratulations on your award that you just got, by the way. That's pretty cool. I'm just looking through your uh, your timeline. You're being honored, which is really cool. The Salute Her Awards. What was that about? Oh, it was actually really cool. Cafe Mocha is a radio station. They have a radio network in 43 different markets. They have the Salute Her Awards, and it was a so much fun, which I didn't expect because it was a virtual award, but it was for the work that I've been doing through Black Voters Matter around engaging people in this last election cycle. And so it was seven awardees and it was just, I mean, just really honored. It's usually people who are in kind of entertainment mm -hmm. or sports or influence. And so it was really great. That's awesome. Well, you deserve a lot of awards. I, I consider your your work and the work uh, of your of your colleagues, the activists and organizers that you've been working with absolutely heroic. And we have you to thank for so, so much. And I think history is going to look very fondly on you, unlike some of the people that you have been uh, fighting for years with. Can I can I just start, though? Can I just add, I was doing all my research and prep getting ready to, to, to talk with you. And I thought it might be interesting just to talk a little bit about uh, your childhood, because I think it's important to who you are. And you were born and raised in the South, specifically Selma. Do I have that right? Is Wikipedia wrong? Yeah, I try to get I, it right. I was actually, believe it or not, I was actually born in New Jersey, but I was raised in Alabama. OK. And so my mother left my father at three. So I don't know. I guess he wouldn't act right. I don't know. <laughs> but my, my, <laughs> my, my um, mother actually came to her family in Alabama at the age of three. And so um, I grew up my entire life. I don't know anything other than Alabama. And a part of it was in Mobile, Alabama. And then at the age of 12, I moved to Selma. And so Selma was kind of like the firing rod. That's where I was shaped and got my political ideology and, you know, just kind of grew up as a young person. But it's ironic because that is also Orville in that whole area, the Black Belt area. That's where the origin of my family that were brought here as enslaved Africans, that's where they were brought. They were brought to that area. And so the origins of my family are right there in the Black Belt. And I was brought back to the Black Belt and I was raised there. Wow, that's interesting. Do you think you missed anything about New Jersey? Have you heard? No, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Have you done the whole lineage thing and followed your the ancestry or the history of your family? Have you ever done that? Or has it been I, you know, so interesting you say that. I've been on last night I was on Ancestry dot com. Hmm. You know, I I'm writing a it's so funny because I was kinda inspired about I was inspired to write this little short film. I wrote a short film last night, really dealing with ancestry, because I like literally popped up in my box. I had a 
one of my cousins on the Europe. My grandfather's father is is Irish. Um, or at least we've been thinking he was hmm. Irish, and then it came back that he's Scottish. So I was like, "Well, what is it?" And so one of my my cousins from Scotland <laughs> reached out. It was like, "I know this seems strange, but we're kin, we're related." And so I just had like this funny laugh. I was like, "Okay, who would have known?" I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "That's funny." Now that you're this well known activist and organizer, like white people in Scotland are like, "I think we have relations." I think, <laughs> I think maybe you should have me, but th- but it's also like. You you saying that is interesting because I, I feel like one of those companies, whatever they are, Ancestry dot com or, or whatever that show that uh, Professor Skip Gates did, like they should yeah, they should do that. Route. You shouldn't be looking into that, or if you have to pay for it, like someone should profile your lineage. That'd be a great thing for them. I'm gonna try to make. I'm gonna tweet about that. Get them yeah, to, you to do your tweet family. About that. Yeah, I, we need to make that happen. Let's go. I actually have a really interesting sure. family background. Even my 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 grandfather was born in 1905. Um, and his parents, he had his parents, his mother was the granddaughter of the first ancestor who was an enslaved African woman. And her, his father was the grandson of the uncle who had actually purchased my, my, my great grandmother, my great, great, great. Wow. And so they've got an interesting, a really, really interesting, it's a very interesting sure. line. And because they all live to over a hundred. Like, look, I don't know how in the world they all live. My grandfather was 104. What? Was in his right mind. He literally never was bedridden. He was literally six. He was sick for two weeks before he died. He was like, yeah, I don't think I like this laying in the bed thing. He was like, peace out. <laughs> what? Like, I'm gone. And there's right? another, and he, cent- uh, what is it, centurion? Oh, no, no, at least in his line. Like, literally, I'm like only four generations. His mother was 99. Her mother was 106, and her mother was 113. Well, what what so the hell is that they, about? What, what the you... interesting thing is that the first 40 years, like, they drink moonshine. They're like, come on. Were, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Maybe that's the answer. Maybe that's the answer. Let's get know. brewing. Let's get brewing. My, uh, they, they, You know, I always would hear the story about my grandmother, his mother, my grandfather's mother, and it was like up until she died at the age of 99, you know, if you ask her how she lived so long and then they're actually active, you know, how she lived so long, mm-hmm. she would say, I take a swig of whiskey every night before I go to sleep. So there's something I I don't know. Maybe they had to see. Well, that would mean I'm going to live to 200 because I drink a whole bottle every night right now. Um, that's that's wild. That's fascinating. That Just the, the, the lifespan of, of anybody. But I mean, thinking about your history, I mean, I'm going to get on them. I'm going to somebody should profile your whole family. You, they, you guys, I mean, everybody's got a story to tell, but you have an amazing story to tell and you've been telling it. Uh, for the past several years when people ask, but I, I think it's super important to talk about how you arrived at, at, at who you are and the work you're doing. So you mentioned that your childhood, I think you use like a, a blacksmithing metaphor. It, it, it shaped who you are. And could you share with me what you mean by that? Like a specific experience or yes. mentor, or was it just being in Selma? You can't deny its history. You know, it's it's kind of a couple of things. One, the shaping of who I am, I think it's about your environment, what you're exposed to, you know, and kind of like what you were kind of brought to this earth having the propensity for. And so even as a child, I always, there was these two things, it's like a running joke in my family. As a child, I always, anywhere I would go with my family, particularly I would travel with my grandmother a lot. I always wanted to know who was in charge, who owned. And so we, who owned the place? So we would go in the Dairy Queen. And my first question we walked in is, who owns it? And my grandmother, and, and we could go in the Walmart. We can go in a church. We could be in the cathedral. And I was like, who owns it? And, and to the point where it was like a running joke of my family. My grandmother was like, baby, I don't know. Like, it's Kmart. I don't know who owns this. Like, <laughs> and I always had this piece around, even to this day, it's so interesting because I recognize I do this to this day. I go in in a space and I'm always scanning to see who's in charge. And it's like literally Hmm. nine times out of 10, I can figure out who's in charge, who owns. And then the second thing is that I always, it did not matter. I was a little girl that would jump in the fights if I saw the bullies messing with the the smaller boys, mm-hmm. I would be the girl that would like, nope, you're not going to be, uh, that would, would, would jump in it. It didn't matter if 
you were bigger than me. It didn't even matter if you I, could beat me up, right? Because, of course, most of those boys were much stronger than I was. Sure. I was a little skinny girl, right? But I never like to see people abuse their power. So I think there's a couple so of you- things that I just, like my entire life, I never like to see the abuse of power. And I never could mm-hmm. understand how people would just let folks abuse, see other people being bullied and not jump in. Well, I, I have a, I have a, an answer to that that I want to get your take on. But more importantly, do you think that, that those two attributes, characteristics of your personality uh, about wondering who owned the place and, and having that, care, that, that very sharp curiosity and then the other one just about standing up to bullies, do you think they're, they're kind of nature or nurture? Was there an experience? Was there an older sibling, uh, an adult, a book, a movie, something that made you – be that way or do you think it's just kind of uh, nature and that's how just that's who you are that's how you were born you know it's i i i'm wondering it's so interesting because i always ask that question myself i'm hmm. like did i see some abuse of power you know i grew up in a, a in a very stable household i never saw like the the misuse of power in my household in that kind of way i really do you know in my family they would often say we don't understand why she's like that like I don't remember ever not being that way, you know, so I, I'm not so sure if perhaps I was a, like in, in the maybe maybe it's a light another lifetime or something. I'm not really sure. But from the time that I remember my my family said I've been that way, you know, and so I think part of my environment and, and just me being an inquisitive child, I think that part of I think there were some elements in me that were already there, but then I also think that there were some things that were nurtured too, because I remember being a little, I remember being a child, maybe like, like seven or eight. And I was, and I remember riding with my family and trying to figure out why were the railroad tracks so magical? Like, I want to know what magic the railroad tracks had, because for some reason on one, no matter where we would travel or where we would go on one side of the railroad tracks, that's where the black people live. And and the community looked a certain uh, kind of way. And on the other side of the railroad tracks, for some reason, those homes were big <laughs> and large. I didn't understand, like, what is the magic with the railroad tracks? And so there was something around. I had this deep sense of knowing or feeling like something was off. Something just wasn't right. Something didn't feel fair. Right. And I would always have. <laughs> it's interesting because I'm getting hazed right now by my niece who has the same thing. She was like, it's not fair. How old is she? She's seven. Go ahead. She's seven. And so there was something about fairness that just seemed like it was just so natural to me. And just like, why would you not want to be fair? And so I think part of it is, you know, I think we all come here um, with some, some kind of propensity towards something. And so I think part of it, I came, But I do believe that it was nurtured in the environment I was in for me to be able to see and witness the differences that I saw. And then when I was raised in Selma and learning the stories around the civil rights movement, even though my family were regular working class, I didn't grow up in an activist family. Hmm. You know, my my my, um, they were really good, solid folks who like engaged in but they weren't like a like activists in that kind of way. But there was something about. You know, I think that this intersection of them laying the foundation around faith, um, because I did have this belief that there was this fair God that was fair and just and loved everybody. And so if God said we got to love everybody, then why don't people treat each other like they love everybody? That was I was always really obsessed with this concept of what we say love. Like I, Mm -hmm. I didn't understand if if love is this real thing, right? And I experienced that even in my family, then why weren't people acting like everybody was supposed to be loved, you know? And so those things I think were part of kind of the shaping of who I am. And then as I got older and kind of understood, had a deeper analysis through books, like literally it was books. I was a avid and continue on some level to be an avid book reader. And I literally would escape in books and it was so much, those questions, I would always kind of find these questions and be able to expand my experiences. And so I think that's, that was part of the piece that actually helped kind of move me forward around, you know, thinking about Look, really kind of shape my political ideology. I, I love everything you're saying. I especially love that you're able to go into your, your childhood and, 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 and draw those stories and observations out. And I'd love to just 
uh, follow up on one thing with the train track uh, that that's fascinating because it sounds like you're too young to understand really race at that point. But you right. but but did you did you look at the other side of the track and and think it was better and that yours was worse or or was it the other way around or what did you think about that side of the track at that that age? Did you want to you be over there? I, no, I don't think that I thought it was worse. I mean, because the, the side of the tracks that I lived on was warm and welcoming and loving to me. Right. What was amazing to me is I couldn't understand. It was really, the, quite frankly, it was a visual. It was the size of the homes. On one side of the mm. railroad track, particularly in the South, you, I would see these homes that every single house looked like it was a mini mansion. So, you know, at the time, and then, you know, as a kid, so I'm looking at these big white antebellum homes mm. and these large homes. Why are these homes with wraparound porches and, you know, huge yards? Why are the homes, why, why are the homes on this side look this particular kind of way? Right. And so it was, I don't think that in, in some ways I was making a value judgment that it's better to live on this side of town. But as a child with eyes, I am looking at, on this side of the town, all of the big houses are. And then many of the people that work, I know that they go over on that side of town. So there's a, there's a, you can actually look at from even the streets, you know, the streets have signs. Like there, there is even in the development, I didn't know it at the time, but in terms of the planning and the development, it looked very different. And so I couldn't understand why did the white people, how did the white people get the big houses with the, with the, the, the wraparound porches, right? And while in my community, I, you know, in many ways, I love my community. I was familiar with it, right. but it was, I, I didn't understand why were those houses so big? When did you, when did you learn the answers to the questions that you had as a, as a little girl growing up in Selma? When did you learn to, I mean, I don't want to fast forward. I just know that I don't have uh, 16 hours with you, which I could take to get to the work that you're doing now. So when, when did you learn about the history of, I guess, voting rights, if we want to zero in on, on your work now? You know, it's interesting. I think that you as a, let me say this, that it doesn't take a deep analysis of, of understanding what it means to be mistreated and to watch it. I watched my grandmother um, who was born in 1910 walk in places and be treated differently than other folks. So, so wh whether, you know, at the point in which I really understood the, 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 uh, the, the deeper analysis about structural racism and, and discrimination, you know, that was probably somewhere in, in my teens as I started reading. Right. But as a child, that's why racism is so insidious and why it is so traumatic and why we have to end that. That even as a child, you know, I remember, you know, the first thing that comes to mind to me is, and, and it, and it's even kind of, painful as I think about it now mm. that in, in Mardi Gras, I grew up, you know, part of my life, I told you my first 12 years was in Mobile, was in the Gulf Coast. Mm -hmm. And so in Mardi Gras actually started, uh, contrary to proper belief, it did not start in New Orleans, it started in Mobile, Alabama. Oh. And so in Mobile, the children, when we were out going to the uh, the parade, to the, uh, to, to the parade route, we would literally, as a group, we would have to break up. Because we knew we would literally argue, we would literally select groups of, of white people to go stand by because you knew that if you stood in a group of black students that you would not get the good candy. You would not get the good throws. And so part of it, I uh. remember us literally standing and saying, that's my group of white people. No, that's my group. That's uh. my group. And you would split up. And so that you could go get the best, the best position was to get in the position of where there were white children or there were white people. And so that you could actually have a chance of getting the good throws. So there is never a part of black life in this country that you're not acutely aware of how you're treated differently. And so as I got older, you know, I understood, I started understanding more behind the why. I mean, that was the question. The question wasn't when like, you know, around the why, like, why is it there was a particular kind right. of safety? You yeah. know, I understand what you're saying in terms of you, you understood, you, you started with the word mistreatment. You, you understood mistreatment very early on, learning about the history of voting rights and the technicalities of how things worked and power dynamics worked. That, that came through education, through books, through history, and we can talk about specifically what, but 
the, the mistreatment of being a child on a parade route where the people on the floats are throwing out candy. Are you telling me that they didn't throw any black uh, any candy to the black people or the bad candy? Latasha, <laughs> he felt a good not, candy. You, to- you might not get some of those candies, but you would have to know kind of Mardi Gras culture down in, in Mobile. We would get moon pies. So moon pies is a big deal. Mm-hmm. So you would get moon pies and there were different throws like the, the nice necklaces. You know the difference between the nice stuff. Every once in a while, if you stood if you stood in a group with black students, a, a, a black uh, black kids, yeah. unless it was the day of the black parade, because there is a black parade that's on Martin Luther King Street. You would get, you would know that everybody would get stuff. You would get a lot of stuff in the black parade, right? Which was actually organized by the, by black businesses. And so it treated us a different kind of way. But if you were at the main parades or if you were on, particularly on on some of the main parades on the main routes, if you stood, a group of black kids may not get anything. Or if you get thrown something, there's a couple of, it might be a piece of candy. You know, I don't know if there's bad candy because I'm not so sure as a child you think any candy is bad. I disagree with you there. I disagree with you there. I mean, you know, there's the miniature Snickers and the regular one, and then there's like bit of honey. Like, who wants that? Right, like who wants that? So, you know, you you may get some, but (laughs) in terms of really, the prizes were the big necklaces and the big throws and the the coins and the I, so yeah. you already knew that if you wanted to act, if you wanted to fill your bag and you wanted to have some good stuff, that right. you need to go embed yourself of where the white people were. Because if you stood as a group, they would actually overlook you. Can't even imagine that. I'm so glad you're telling me that story, because that's certainly not something I think that most people can relate to. And I'm so and I want to so much talk more about people who grew up in the South, white and black, obviously black folks. But. But it's it's such an it's such a different place, and then depending on the time that you grew up. But I only have a couple more minutes with you, and I really want to talk about where we're at in America right now. I've said in the introduction, and hopefully people already know of your work, but if they don't, they really should. That you have done as much as anybody to fight for voting rights for black folks, especially. You've helped win in Alabama and in Georgia, and you are now in the mix of the fight right now. And so I just want to ask you kind of a historical perspective in terms of the Voting Rights Act was a major accomplishment of the civil rights movement. It has been gutted by Republicans on the Supreme Court and now Republicans in Congress that refuse to confirm it, even though they always did. All of the Republicans in the Senate confirmed it up until fairly recently. How far set back are we now with over 43 states, 250 new laws, mostly based on the big lie that there was election fraud? How far back are we and do we have to... I don't want to know what word to use, but to, 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 you know, claw our way back, led by heroes like you, to create more democracy and to stop this horrible racism and nonsense. You know, I, it's, oh, this will take, this will be a longer conversation. I think there's a couple of things around it. What yeah, pick whatever right you now, want. I appreciate that. You but know, you know, the, the, the <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter is the democracy as we know it in this country is extremely fragile. You know, we want we are looking at kind of the Trump presidency as a one off. And I, and I can assure people not only is it not a one off, but unless we strengthen democratic institutions and we literally enshrine those protections in the Constitution and we literally go from this model of making kind of voting rights contingent, depending on what political party is in office, that we have not seen the worst of it. Mm. And so the bottom line is it not, it's not even in the, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, it at at the time, it was absolutely, it was eons ahead of its time that it was certainly a, a strong, um, strong vehicle for expanding and protecting voting rights in this country. But it was a compromise. Even for 1965 was a compromise. And we've held that up as if it is like that we have completely kind of achieved democracy and we have it. Even the Voting Rights Act had literally had to be reauthorized every 25 years. Right. What is that? Right. <laughs> right. Bottom, right. Like the, the bottom line is there is a element of, of what we need to protect the democratic rights of citizens in this country to literally decide who governs them under what conditions they're governed and literally what governs them. Like, and, and I think part of what we have to see is, you know, what is happening right now, this attack on voting rights, 
you know, it's not just an attack on black voters. It fundamentally undermines the very democratic institutions that will actually protect us. That ultimately America, when we're talking about American democracy and as is laid out in the Constitution, it has been aspirational at best. We have never achieved as achieved what is laid out in the Constitution in terms of making sure that we're protecting the democratic right. rights of citizens in this country. And so what we're seeing now is not only we're seeing a, 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 a road to go backwards, but it's actually accelerated, in my opinion, in a, in a time and a period where we're actually seeing a more diverse country, where we're seeing a America's position in the world and the global sphere is shifted. If there is any time that we need to stop and really understand that literally if that democracy is not something that is just forever enshrined into this country, but that fundamentally we need to start looking at a democracy as what are our values around this so that we can strengthen the institutions that support that, that we can actually strengthen and make sure that it doesn't matter. My right to vote should not be contingent upon what political party is in office. Right. My right to vote should not be contingent upon what people feel about me or the next generation 25 years from now, that we literally have to make a quantum leap forward. It's not just responding and beating back the bad voter suppression bills that we're seeing now. That's one component. But what we're going to have to do is make a quantum leap to really how, how to think about how are we going to strengthen the institutions in this country and strengthen the foundation of creating and ensuring democracy for all the citizens in this nation. Yeah, I was so well said and, and, and well framed. I appreciate that reframing of it. But if I were to use a metaphor, you're talking about institutions and foundations. If you think about voting rights, well, white men had 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 very strong cement mansions pretty much since the, the country was founded. But the entire country, the way it was when the Voting Rights Act was gutted, we can decide what 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 metaphor to agree on. But the house was maybe made of wood, but there there were smoldering fires for a lot of people. What you're saying is we need to get to a place where the house, the institution the foundation is made rock solid so that it can't be burnt down it can't be withdrawn so that everybody that's an american citizen basically has the right to vote how how is do you like my metaphor for the framing of it i love your metaphor okay i good. love your metaphor so, i will also say that it wasn't just white men white it was white men let's make the distinction it was white men who owned land right white land only men right and you didn't have wealth you were you were disenfranchised as well. Good point. Very good point. So the the point is we have we have a long way to go because the house is is on fire. And I would love to hear you just here at the end make the point, Latasha, that I, I've been trying to make and I muddle my way through it and I'm and I and I babble as I am right now. But the idea is there are a lot of issues that I care about, that you care about, that activists spend a lot of time on. For example, education, health care, universal health care, the environment. We could talk about disability rights and all immigrant rights and so on. But the issue that you have been laser focused on, that you're an expert on, that you're one of the most successful organizers and activists on with real triumphs is voting rights. Can you make the case that I've been trying to make that this right now? is the only thing that matters because all those other issues I just mentioned, we can't do anything on them if we don't have a vibrant democracy or everybody available to go and cast their vote. Can you make that case? Yes. You know, I think that part of what we have to really recognize is the fluidity of, of, of when we're talking about strengthening our nation, that at the end of the day is kind of like, you know, if you if if we can't go the way of the dinosaur, you know, the, the dinosaur existed until it didn't. And so I think what we're seeing right now, when we're seeing kind of the fragility of democracy, that's not because we just got one bad person in office or one bad president that literally we have to make sure that whatever institutions that exist are in service of people. We are literally gone down a road now that we've got elected officials deciding on who the voters are. Isn't it like, isn't that backwards? The voters should be deciding on who the elected officials are. Right. And secondly, we also have to really recognize that it is important in this moment that just as technology has been a ball game changer, right, that the way that we work, the way that we live, all of those things have shifted over time that I 
democratic practices and institutions have to shift as well. And so there's really an opportunity. We are the wealthiest country in the world, the wealthiest country in the world. What is so fundamentally bad about having like access to health care to everybody in this country? What's what what is really so bad? Like sick people can get well. You know, you know, you know the answer. <laughs> you know, you I mean, know, like, you know like, what is so bad that people right, say. So my, my point is yeah. we have the kind of resources. We've got the, the, the intellectual capacity. We have the ability in a nation that we literally could become a leader in the world of creating a nation that all men and women are created we're in a space that we're saying, yes, we're created equal. We have a, a, a life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness, that this is the place to come, that you can literally create your dream. What has happened is that there are some folks who have had a very, very limited, very uh, limited in their vision that we're still looking back at them saying, well, what did they intend? Well, hell, they didn't even intend for me to be talking to you right now because they couldn't even see my humanity. The bottom line is that we have an opportunity to think about what are the possibilities when we all tap into our power that we literally could be a leader in the world, like not as just based on how many nuclear warheads we have, but it's literally based on how we can take care and create systems to show how we can actually take care of our people, have systems that we can show that we actually have the best health care in the world, which we don't. Here it is. We got less than 5%. We should think about it. 5% 5% of the population in the entire world and we're number one in COVID deaths, that in itself should say something. Here we are, the wealthiest country in the world, and we couldn't even take care of our people for two months, right? After, and you know, we've got something that's fundamentally wrong. We are not being good stewards over the resources that are in this country. We are not utilizing our intellectual capacity and our innovation and our minds to really create and advance humanity. We're so, we're, we've created a culture that in many ways is very dysfunctional. People are literally working and making more money, but hell, they're killing their hearts as they're doing it. Right. And so at the end of the day, how can we create a nation, a world that literally we all thrive? What is so terribly bad? about that oh my gosh i love talking to you love listening to you you are uh, a a real life superhero to me the work you've done uh, is already already been way more than most people will ever do uh and i thank you on behalf of my family and 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 folks who i have learned of your work i'm sure uh all thank you and i'm so glad to have talked to you and i can't wait for part two do you have time for three lightning round questions about uh you that people don't know okay here we go i say you're a real life superhero to me but if you could have superpowers like the kind we read about in comic books do you have a preference for a superpower flying invisibility i don't know heat vision yes i would love to be able to be invisible i want to be like wonder woman right just so you can any, any particular reason, anything that you want to do, because I would just pop up in all kind of conversations. Like, I would, or like <laughs> wait, I, you I'm would like, go invisible. Would then you in would be in the Vatican. Like I would, I'll be in the Vatican and I want to hear this conversation between the Pope. And I was like, what, what is he saying? Wait, <laughs> wait, wait. Are you saying that you would show up invisibly and then you would uncloak in the middle? Like you'd be like, here I am. Absolutely. And then of course, I, I'm a black woman. I would have to give my opinion now. I'd have to give my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I want to do a comedy sketch where you just pop into conversations. Okay. Um, do you cook? And if so, what do you like to make for yourself? I like to make salmon. I'm not a big mm. cook, but mm. I do like, uh, I, I think I make the best salmon, probably because it's an easy dish, but I make great salmon. <laughs> you are now a very highly uh, respected person. Uh, you're also a talented singer songwriter. Um, who is, though, somebody and I was nervous to interview you today because I, I respect your work so much and you're, you're such an important person. But who is somebody that you were nervous? I'm sure you've met everybody now. They're all you know, all these celebrities look at you like a celebrity and rightfully so. Who is someone that you were nervous to meet? Oh, my God. Prince. I am the biggest Prince fan in the whole wide world. Let me tell you what happened. I followed Prince for three years. I actually was in private parties with Prince. And I'm such a fan of Prince. And it's so interesting because I have the nerves to be critical of super fans that I never said anything to him. And so I'm in this Prince group. And once he died, I realized that he had been talking to all of the people in the Prince group. I was like, y'all talk to him. They was like, yeah, he would talk to you. I, it's like my biggest regret ever. I would turn into a little 
paw, ball of mush around Prince. That's hilarious. Anybody that you want to meet that you haven't met? I do. I want to meet the Dalai Lama. Oh, interesting. You the should Dalai use your Dalai Lama and and Jimmy Carter. I love President Jimmy Jimmy Carter. So I want to meet Jimmy Carter and I want to meet the Dalai Lama. I love people who really have a strong, I think, anchoring around kind of their spiritual analysis. But those are the two people that I want to be. Oh uh, right well, now. I know. Sting. It would... I got a question on Sting. Okay, well, Dalai Lama and Sting. I don't know that we well, how we can help you there. But if anybody listening. <laughs> It's close to either of them. But I think that Twitter can come together and, and, and create a, a meeting between you and Jimmy Carter. I'm going to lead the fight on that. It's the least we can do. Okay, finally, uh, how about this? You seem fearless, and I don't want you to answer a serious concern or fear. I want you to give me like a joke answer, like what, Latasha, are you afraid of, like spiders or heights or something like that? Oh, what am I afraid of? What am I afraid of? Oh, that's so – you know what? Being lost. I don't like not not having that. Um, how to explain? Good it. answer. Yeah, like, that's interesting. Like directions, yeah. Like I'm one of those folks. Like if you, I always had to have a compass. Like I have to have an orientation of where north and south is, or like like I freak out. That's a great answer. Last one. I am cult. My cultural blind spot is music. You're a singer songwriter, very talented. I was just listening to your music. I'll actually play some on the way in and out of the interview. Uh, but, but what is, uh, what is a, you mentioned Prince. So if you can sit back and, and listen to a song or an artist, maybe it's someone we don't know. Maybe it's someone everybody knows. Who do you, who do you like to, to listen to? I'm sure you have a different artist or, or genre or music for everything that you're doing, whether it's driving or on vacation or working out, but who, who, I don't know. Who do you like? Listen, if you listen to my, my playlist, you would think I'm schizophrenic. So yeah, go ahead. between. Is a tie between um, Fred Hammond and U2. I love Magnificent by U2. I, it doesn't matter where I am listening to that song. Like wow. does something, it's something to me. My favorite band. Um, yeah, I love U2. Mm. Don't, Magnificent is like one of my favorite songs. I love Fred Hammond, who's a, a gospel singer as well. Um, and, and so those are like, like when I'm in, like in my mode, I was like, okay, I, you know, that's what I like. And Mahalia Jackson. So at any point in time, you listen to my, my song list, you play list, you be like, mm, she's a little schizophrenic. No, that's <laughs> good. That's good to have a, a lot of different uh, eclectic taste, different, different genres. All right. Now we just let, I'm pretending that we're live. And my favorite song, I should have said that my favorite song in the whole wide world, in the whole wide, whole, whole wide world is Jolene by Dolly Parton. I cry when I hear Jolene. I wish I had it queued up. I want to make you cry. Yes, and Twitter, Twitter needs to help me get uh, to Dolly Parton because I okay, Dolly Parton Dolly and Parton. Jimmy Carter. We're gonna uh, work and on Jimmy both. Jimmy Carter. All right, so I'm uh, just I'm pretending we're live and we have a caller who wants to ask a follow up, and the the caller's name will call him Phil. Uh, Phil, you're on the air with the great Latasha Brown. What do you want to say? Following up on the lightning round, uh, I just wanted to say uh, Sting. Sting. I love Sting. Sting's so sexy. And mm-hmm. he's like, he's brilliant. He is a brilliant musician. Mm-hmm. He's a brilliant musician. I love that he's really rooted in his culture. I really love that he's rooted around like the, the merging of politics and he can go jazz and he can hmm. go rock. Just, I mean, Sting is all that. All right. Broadway, I mean, really. All right. Well, uh, Phil, thanks you. He took his answer off the air. Latasha Brown, <laughs> what an honor. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this was fun. I really enjoyed talking to you finally. This was fun. Thank you so much. And here she is, herself, Latasha Brown, with So High. Yeah. I like it. All right. Now I want to let her send us into the introduction to my second guest of today's show. He is a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He is a national security analyst at NBC News and MSNBC. He's got a brand new Substack. I really want you to subscribe to it. ClintWatts.Substack.com. You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Selected Wisdom. He's also apparently on Clubhouse. How about that? Massive following on Twitter, over 200 followers. And I'm always very happy to have him joining me here on Stand Up to analyze the latest threat matrix. We talked a lot about domestic terrorism and more. Here he is right now, the great Clint Watts on Stand Up. 
There he is, Clint Watts, in his undisclosed bunker somewhere. And, uh, you know, you do national security. You have to have an undisclosed bunker, right? Isn't you, can't, that what- you can't do national security above ground. There's a rule. <laughs> You're not, are you allowed to have windows? Subterranean. Oh, really? And some windows. That's some. Um, <laughs> Well, you have a window in the look of a lot of extremists. How about that for a segue? That's right. That's right. I, I dressed down today. You know why, uh, Pete? I had no water this morning when I got up. The well was off. So oh. I'm waiting here to fill back up. Oh, wow. Because would... we're subterranean, you get problems like well issues. Well, how yeah. often do you, do you study the preppers? Um, do, they ever, do they ever influence you? Do you have a bucket? Do you have a survival, uh, Pat Robertson or whoever those I guys do are? Not, I do not have a Glenn Beck survival bucket <laughs> Glenn Beck. yet, but, but I should have had buckets of water today. I, I'm hoping at the end of this uh, interview, I, I will have uh, access to a shower. Have, so. have you learned nothing, sir? I mean, you were in the military. Is there not a, a kind of yeah. like a food item or something like sea rations that you, you actually is good that you would want just even regardless of the apocalypse? Yeah, jerky, beef jerky. You should always have... And uh, to just be easy on the heart, turkey jerky, which is, you know, <laughs> less fat, a little bit better for you. You're yeah. actually not allowed to say turkey jerky on this podcast. Uh, is, is that illegal? It's both a family values and sponsorship issue. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, turkey jerky and ramen uh, with a little bit of cheese will get you a long way. And that I do know. Lots to talk with you about outside of uh, prepping and, and doom buckets. And uh, I'm very excited to, to be to have you back on the podcast. You're doing excellent work as always. But I want to just start with my opinion that I my optimistic opinion, I think, um, which I think is still true. And maybe you're going to punch holes in it, that the, the very best thing to have to happen as a result of the insurrection and the events of the past few months or even four years is that Donald Trump is no longer on Twitter and social media in general. I think that is such a big deal. You study all of this and how messages travel. What do you think? Am I right? Wrong? Is, is, is it going underground? Is it actually a bad thing and I'm missing it? No, you're correct. Uh, two parts, right? Information and, and extremism collided on January 6th. We saw how lies powered radicalization and violence. And now what you're seeing is how those two in that event have created the, the logic by which President Trump can be removed from the platforms. And that creates a huge downward pressure, meaning there's less to get excited about uh, if you're a, a fan of the president because you can't hear him. And the second part is... It is awful and sad, you know, what happened in terms of the violence, but this has given the preemptive uh, ability to the FBI to go after a lot of these networks before because they could not. They had not violated a crime and they were hiding in plain sight due to free speech. And so what January 6th did do is created a series of predicate crimes where the FBI can now go at a lot of these networks in a very determined way, which they could not do before. So... The fact that he can't uh, yell and scream all day and create brand new rumors, conspiracy narratives, much less combat facts that are actually occurring in the end is a good thing. Is it some kind of censorship of speech? You know, you've studied how other nations have handled this. You've also obviously studied Twitter, uh, studied Twitter and Facebook and other other social media. Are there any kind of, you know, moral conflicts, much less national security issues with, you know, bump, uh, booting somebody off these major platforms? Uh, I think it will continue to be a debate about what is permissible free speech. But what was interesting about January 6th, it was very clear that lies led to violence. And it's the same as screaming fire in a movie theater when there's no fire. I do think that principle still holds. And you could see it that day. I, I mean, Rudy Giuliani was talking about trial by combat, you know, on stage. It's very very clear that's incitement to violence based on false pretenses. And so I think you're seeing on the lies part, Dominion voting systems, you know, these lawsuits are going to be devastating, you know, against the my pillow guy and some of these others. And that is the first time we've seen, we're going to see this like course correction on the information front. I think for the social media companies, uh, they are trying to play the balance between whoever is in office. So part of the reason I think Trump was deplatformed is because two Democrats won in Georgia just a couple days before that. People forget that 
the companies are going to react on where the majority resides and how that might affect them in terms of regulation, what they think they're supposed to do. Um, where the majority, where the start. political majority in Congress resides, Twitter and Facebook are going to yeah. do one thing if it's Republicans and a different if it's Democrats and then a different thing in Australia or, or Germany. Yeah, I mean, they're trying to look, you're a company, you're trying to wade through what is permissible free speech, but no one's told you what's permissible. And it's happening on your platform. And so, uh, look, full disclosure, I've worked with social media companies, you know, and I've worked with the government. And so I understand both of them like push pull, but it really comes down to Congress saying, what do you want them to police? And if you sat there and watch any of the hearings, even uh, Director Ray, you're like, wow, it's like two different worlds up there. So if you're a Facebook, Twitter, Google, TikTok, any of them, you're like, which of these things do I police this week and what don't I police? And as soon as I do, I'm getting beat up from the other direction. Right. Uh, just take off your expert hat for a minute and let me just bullshit with you for a second. You mentioned Rudy Giuliani talking about it's going to be combat. The, the the one comment that Trump made, I mean, he made his, these kind of comments over and over and maybe he was repetitive. He knows how to do that. He certainly promoted January 6th nonstop and there was a lot of money and, and funny behind it. But he said it's going to be wild. Clint. That's right. I get hung and up. On, I really get hung up on that one comment. Yeah, he told us it was going to be wild and it was. And. You know, I, I, I also I'm interested in how it will shake out with the acting secretary of defense, uh, Miller. And I like that he has come out and done a couple of interviews. If you get a chance to read the Vanity Fair interview with the reporter that was with him, that the day, former acting, uh, uh, Trump's former acting, yep, yeah. final act. And yeah. In that interview, he talks about he had spoken with the president and his staff the night before. And they were like, oh, you're going to need more. And, he, and they were like. For what? Like we we are the Department of Defense. You know, what what do you want? And it's like, it's going to be crazy. You know, and you're like, could you imagine being the acting sec def? You've been there three weeks. Your commander in chief is like, there's going to be something big. You just got to be ready. And then you go, I have no legal means by which to deploy. And oh, by the way, uh, General Flynn, who used to work in this department, is out there saying there's going to be martial law and that the military is going to show up, you know. <laughs> Like what an impossible position to navigate. You've been there 21 days. I know people yeah. are upset with them in terms of response, but I, I yeah, I, he did the interview as well with, uh, I think it was vice. And yeah, I, he was very straightforward. He was like, mm -hmm. president Trump did this. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know, like stop yelling at me. Like, what did you want me to do? He is my boss, actually. I yeah. heard I heard those comments. I just excerpts of those comments last week. I'll go back and look at it. The, you know, the other just broad stroke before I get specific and talk about your new sub stack, which is very specific on the ideology of today's domestic extremists. Very, very good. It's just the idea that they promoted the hell out of a date like a concert. Right. Yeah. On January 6th, we're all going to meet for the big party. And then they did the party. And then the other key thing, and I mean, I, I know you work on probably January 6th, a lot of your day. You spend a lot of time thinking about that day, but I, I do as well. And, and, I, and I just always think about, like, if, if Bono was singing at the garden and then he was like, everybody follow me. We're going to walk all the way up to the Upper West Side. Like, a lot of the people in the garden would go with him. Trump said, let's head over to the Capitol. I'm going to walk over there with you. Like, I just think about Instead, that. Take your scenario, Pete. That's yeah. a great scenario. Instead, it, let's say it gets out of control, right? And people are hurt or whatever. It stops traffic. Would you chew out the cops? Like, so that's kind of what happened, right? Like all of this unfolded and it was terrible. And there, there were mistakes made, sure. But then we hauled every law enforcement officer that was at the D.C. Capitol Police in front of Congress. And both sides of Congress yelled at him, like, why didn't you protect us? And like, hey, man. The president is out in the yard telling these people to come to the Capitol. Instead, they yelled at them. It's really weird, like psychosis of like how it's gotten turned around. And then they hauled the FBI director out and they're like, FBI director, why didn't you stop this? And it was like, what do you mean? Like the president was out in the yard. It's weird how we're kind of going all the way around the horn on January 6th. Lots of mistakes made. But the number one impetus for this was President Trump. He was telling people to be there.
The, the, you, 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 I feel like you haven't been as critical of FBI or some of the national security agencies as a result of uh, uh, maybe I haven't read every tweet and, and, and every article. But my one criticism is that, you know, after 9-11, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember there were press conferences every day. I mean, I remember even mm-hmm. during the invasion of Iraq, like the invasion, Don Rumsfeld came out every day and and, and said bullshit. And whether you like any of that or not, I always like more exposure, more uh, press conferences. And I feel like we haven't seen Chris Ray nearly enough. He's only done, I think, one appearance in front of the Senate. Like, I want a press conference every day since January 6th or at least a few. I feel like there hasn't been nearly enough transparency from the government, from the FBI, especially in, in potentially DOJ. I know there was a transition and everything. But what are your, what are your thoughts on that? It, usually it's the attorney general, just so you know, like – if you remember back on Comey, part of the reason Comey got is such a weird snag is he ha- held his own press, press conference around, you know, in and around Loretta Lynch. That's not normal. The FBI director, uh, aside from working with the attorney general, usually it should be the attorney general shows up, does a press conference, and the FBI director speaks to the facts of the case and everything. Um, that's part of the problem because it was bar up until Inauguration Day. Uh, Merrick Garland's been there like a week. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if that picks up, but it is not normal for the FBI director to have lots of press conferences unless it's we file charges today um, on Chinese hackers or something like that. It's not normal for the FBI director to have lots of like public events like that, whereas you would with the secretary of defense. But it's also not normal to have a, 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 an insurrection on our capital. I feel right. like I, I still feel like we, we haven't been told enough. And, and I'm a big, you know, kind of government pro government propagandist in terms of I want people to trust government in, in uh, you know, in the end. And I feel like if they're not talking enough, no matter who it is, Republicans, Democrats, if we're not hearing enough from them and on this specific situation, I just feel like we haven't heard enough from them. But I can hear uh, the, a, a lot from you because you're analyzing this stuff all the time. And uh, I'm psyched that you're doing a sub stack, which is great. I've always enjoyed watching your testimony, reading your book, watching your TED talk, reading your editorials. But the sub stack is, is great because uh, I get to subscribe to it. And you've revived the selective selected wisdom brand and with it. <laughs> um, and you've, I guess, just posted this, this, this first one, part two coming, right? Yes, uh, we were. I I was getting yelled at today for being too slow on part two. Oh, really? It, but <laughs> it will come this week. I'm well, thinking Thursday morning is when I'll do it. Well, so. consider me someone yelling at you because I'm I'm hanging on it. Like I I, I love following your stuff. I, I trust you. I think you have a lot of credibility, and I always love being able to ask questions. But the the question you ask uh, with your first first post is the the broad question: How will lies power domestic terrorism? In 2021, preventing domestic extremism in America. We all want that. Um, This is a a great thorough post. It's got charts, which is very helpful because I like pictures. And you're you're telling us who the domestic extremist landscape is. Is And there's a lot of different overlapping groups and Venn diagrams, and it's hard to untangle that stuff. But you do it for us in this post, which is the best way to look at it. But we're in a conversation. So where do we start by identifying who these groups are, where they are, and, of course, their demographics? So I think the first thing to talk about is ideology, because everyone wants to talk about what they believe in that justifies their violence. I would also say that it doesn't matter as much this time. And so what you heard Director Ray say when he was testifying was, we only police violence, right? We don't police ideas. And that's where this all gets a little bit tricky because oftentimes, as you know, if it's QAnon, the ideas aren't really well flushed out nor make a whole lot of sense, right? So like back in the Al-Qaeda ISIS era, if you rewind like 20 years, we were like, we have to figure out their justifications for violence and try and undermine them. Like, I don't know what you would do on the QAnon, right? The train never stops. So, like, what's interesting is 20 years later, I would say that we wasted a lot of time focused on the ideology before. And this time we can focus more on the violence part. The other part that's, you know, wrapped up in this and in there, you'll see that there's really three currents. There's the race based white supremacist groups. There are militia type groups. Then there are conspiracy, you know, sort of factions. But they are often separated by age, if you look at it. And Director Ray kept emphasizing that. So January 6th, those were organized groups that were showing up based on a predicted date, right, that was pushed out by the president and his supporters. But that's not the worst 
uh, violent offenders really that are out there. Those are like the Atlanta shooter we saw last week. These are individuals online that work in online collectives, oftentimes around white supremacy, also uh, misogynist views or what's known as incel, you know, uh, involuntary celibates. Uh, combine that with the anti-government type, type groups that are younger, like the Boogaloo movement you'll hear about, which are literally trying to accelerate a second civil war. You have two different quadrants essentially on that chart that are both concerning, but in different ways. And their tendency to move towards violence uh, is different. The younger online folks move very quickly and there's less warning. Um, the militia groups, you could see it coming on January 6th. They are more devastating when they act because they're organized and better skilled and older, but they're less frequent. Three percenters, you know, proud boys, oath keepers. Yeah. And what you're seeing now, even since I wrote this, is many splinter groups and factions are emerging from those because January 6th occurred. And there are many chapters around the country of those militia groups, and they vary dramatically. In some places, it's cosplay show up with AR-15s. In other places, it's let's overthrow right. the government and capture Gretchen Whitmer, right? Like it's <laughs> it's wildly uh, different. So you're seeing them say the Proud Boys is interesting. I think it was a branch in Alabama sort of like disavowed. Another one was, uh, I think, in St. Louis and basically said, we're going to go back to drinking and, you know, misogyny. You know, there there's a lot of currents going on right now. So you'll get these wild splinters coming up, which some will be more dangerous and probably younger. They'll skew younger. And all of this has to do with the Internet and social media. And that's changed everything so much since Timothy McVeigh. And and we hear the the phrase lone wolf. We've always heard that. And now nobody's alone. I'm not alone. I'm in my shed and technically I'm alone. But I have hundreds of people now in my community that I communicate with. Luckily, we're good people who don't want to uh, hurt anybody, um, and and we're a great network of folks. But that's what you can do. There's, I feel like there's no such thing as the the lone wolf. Given your diagram and and the extremist landscape, nobody's alone. You can always find someone else that shares your whatever. That that's the big change over twenty years. Is uh, even rewind to. Timothy McVeigh, Eric Rudolph, the 1990s, the Unabomber, they were far more isolated. They still had networks they worked on. They weren't entirely alone, especially in McVeigh's circumstance and Rudolph's. Uh, Unabomber won. Una, you know, that's why he was kind of alone. That isn't the case nowadays. They Very rarely uh, does someone act entirely alone. You look at the Nashville bombing on Christmas Day, right? And the report just came out. Um did that totally by himself, right? Uh, operationally, it doesn't line up with any particular ideology, but he does support a lot of conspiracies. He surely was in online communities that are sharing these ideas all the time. Uh, if you, I'm interested in the Atlanta shooter in the coming weeks, how much he was connected to many, you know, it could be anti-Asian hate, could be white supremacy, could be uh, incel. Uh, you know, it could be three or four of these sort of ideologies. He's in these communities and decides the only way he can handle it is execute violence. So that's the troubling part for the FBI that you heard Director Ray talk about. He brought up encryption. We can't see how these guys coordinate, plot, and plan. Uh, You know, we have no way to even go. It used to be you could file a subpoena, right, and then you could do a Title III, which is the wire, the whole series, the wire on HBO. Can't do that now. People have encrypted apps. Everything's sort of closed. The next part is online. When can you watch what they're doing on social media? You have to have an open case. You can't, as the FBI, just suck in the entire Internet and go, oh, that looks bad. Let's go start a case. You can't do that. You have to have a tip or a lead. So who's going to give you a tip or a lead in an anonymous online collective, you know, like the Atlanta Uh. shooter was probably involved in some of these spaces. And then they've not committed any crimes. So what's your predicate to investigate them? They, They don't like people. That's very clear. But you can't start a case on not liking people. That would that would be 40 percent of America right now. Right. Like so it's a <laughs> yeah. capacity issue. You've just explained the answer kind of to my 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 next question was going to be. But, Clint, I want 100 percent privacy and 100 percent security. That's right. Deliver, dude. Deliver it to me right to the shed, please. Hundred percent via a drone. If that's Nothing not bad should happen. Don't look at anything I say. Right. Yeah. 
it it's impossible the other the other part is that so it's not just the connections it's the speed of online communication right so if you went into some of these forums let's say on telegram or gab or parlor when it was up and running i mean there was extremism everywhere i mean everywhere you could i don't know how you don't find it and so then imagine the fbi which has fewer people probably half as many people as the nypd right like how on earth do you triage all of that and point to where you should focus? It's really troublesome. Let me just ask you, though, going back to demographics, you, uh, for most of your career, looked at extremists, especially not, maybe not most, but you looked a lot as, as much as anybody in, in jihadists, ISIS, Al Qaeda mm-hmm. and the like. They were almost uh, entirely um, identified as Muslim. Uh, most of them were brown, but not necessarily, but mostly. And they were almost entirely men and probably younger men. When I look at your diagram today um, and, and this uh, Substack post, it's almost entirely white men. And then I think the age is, is, is different. There's a lot of older guys we, we see uh, and we can talk about who showed up in and, and, and Washington, D.C. White men might not like to hear that. You and I are white guys. We don't hate white men, white people, but you're in national security. You analyze the threat matrix. How important is it um, to talk about the fact that most of these guys are white? Most of them are men. Most of them are probably skew younger. And if anything, if they're religious at all, they're they're often very uh, religious in terms of identifying as some kind of Christian. There's a huge overlap with QAnon Christianity or religious folks, right? That's correct. And uh, demographically, it is it's across the board. It's white men for the most part. Even if you went to the fringe left anarchist, uh, separately Antifa, which is against fascist, right? That is a reactionary sort of movement. And there is a small amount of that. It's a trickle, you know, like it's 20 to one white supremacist to Antifa. And then that's mostly the other dimension of that is property damage or street fights versus guy shows up with AR-15, you know, or a handgun in Atlanta or whatever it might be. Especially the more, at one thing, just to kind of defend the Antifa pro, I mean, they generally don't buy into insane conspiracy theories. For example, like an Antifa kid doesn't show up, number one, with a gun, I think that we've seen. And number two, he doesn't show up with a gun at a place that basically doesn't exist. I'm thinking of the pizza joint in DC or I mean, you, right. you cited a the couple conspiracy based groups. Yeah. Like, like they, they, these guys show up at places that don't even exist or to, for reasons that completely are whole cloth. And you just don't see that on the far left. Yeah. I think you, if we see uh, more policing on the fascist sort of side, I wouldn't be surprised. If you really kind of see that and it won't go away entirely. There's always been anarchist groups or anti-fascist kind of groups that are out there, but you may see a downturn in that, you know, it, as time goes on, if, if the politics around everything changes, but separately, I mean, the militia group phenomenon is way larger than it was. We, we talked about the Michigan militia, right? In the late nineties, I think when I was starting in Quantico in 2002, like that was the case study of domestic terrorism. And it was a story about Eric Rudolph. You could write 20 of those from the last four years, you know, 20 case studies like that easily. So the scale is huge. Um, And it it is about shifting demographics in this country. You know, it is about a lot of these pressure points that are happening in the U S and I, I don't think it's surprising when you look at the shifts that you're seeing that look overwhelming. These extremists are 90% plus uh, white males. I just thought of something and I'm sitting here trying to look it up and not doing a good job. So, cause I wanted to get it right, but I don't know if you heard uh, Senator Roy Blunt, who just re- announced he'd be retiring from Missouri. Uh, he was on, I think it was based the nation, one of the Sunday shows. And, and it was being asked about the insurrection and, does he agree with Ron Johnson or, or, or former President George Bush, who said he was disgusted by that? And he said he agreed with former uh, President George Bush. And it was, you know, it was decent. His answers were were what you'd hope until the end when he was asked about, you know, the root causes. And he said something. I'm paraphrasing. I was shocked. I was out in the yard working, listening to it on headphones. I was I was shocked by this. But he basically said, we don't need to analyze, you know, what, who, why they were there. Something about analyzing the psychology. You spend a lot of time doing that. And I, I've heard that kind of rhetoric from other Republicans. We don't need to really look into the the January 6th in general. I, I was shocked by that, Clint. Um, is, isn't he entirely wrong about root causes, psychology, recruiting, 
and what makes an extremist and why someone would show up in Washington, D.C. and and do what they did? Yes. Uh, Rewind to the Al Qaeda ISIS era. That's all we said. We got to figure out why these guys want to attack America. We need to understand what their motivation. It's how I got into this whole space. Sorry to interrupt. I was in New York on 9-11. I was strictly a stand up comedian. After that happened, all I, every day I asked, I wasn't angry. I wasn't even that angry after 9-11. I remember I was just curious, how could a human being hijack a right. plane and do what they did? And I, I've been asking that question ever since. Sorry. Yeah. And uh, fast forward it 17 years and a guy is in a pizza place, you know, based on child trafficking conspiracies in the basement, you know, craziness. So it shows you how easy the system can unfold over time. The key part is. Why did the hijackers do what they did? It's because an ideological leader gave them permission to, told them to do that, right? Set them up to do that. Gave the ideological reasons to execute the attack. Why did those people show up on January 6th? Or why have they shown up uh, in places like the Walmart in El Paso? Why? Well, you have social leaders or political leaders saying we have to do something. Uh, You have commentary that says we have to start a second civil war or we may need to break away or only real Americans count, right? Mm. Well, that's partitioning that it, that's creating these grievances. And, and so then it's interesting. There was a concept. I would love to do this. If I went back, I don't have time to sort through it, but they would use a concept called defensive jihad, which is if, uh, if Westerners are in Muslim lands, we have to defend Muslim lands. And that then gives us justification to attack Westerners from here to there, meaning New York City. Defensive. Like, they put us in a defensive position. We have to strike back. Listen to the rhetoric of some of our political and social leaders. It is the exact same kind of rhetoric. We have to do something, and if we can't do it uh, through voting, then I guess we'll have to trial by combat, right? We'll have to go to the next step. We'll have to move to the next level. Well, that's pushing from you know, protective free speech to incitement to violence. That's that's what that is. We just treat. So when you hear Blunt say that, I would imagine, I'm not him, but my guess is he's worried intuitively. Wow. We, when you trace this line back far enough, uh, some of the people that we're with and that we hear talk or show up at our rallies or contribute to our campaigns are saying things that are highly similar, trying to justify why we should revert to violence. Yeah. I mean, I think about, uh, Anwar al is his name? Mm-hmm. American citizen. But he was, this dude was just making videos on YouTube. And he was unbelievably effective. And I can think of one, but I think several uh, domestic uh, attacks here, the uh, jihadist inspired by him. San Bernardino comes to mind. Yes. They watched his videos. They went and got guns and, and, and killed people. And this is some guy you know, hold up in a, in a tent somewhere, in a desert somewhere, underground. And, and to find these videos, you have to look really hard. Hannity is basically saying Putin is better than Biden right yes. now. So that's Hannity. It's a different message, but it comes and, and, and the reaction to it. Demet, you, you trust these people. They look like you. They think like you. And they are broadly available, Clint. It's such a different movement and propagandist threat when it comes from the American president or a guy who's got three hours on the radio and one hour on TV every night. I'm talking about Hannity and so many more. Tucker Carlson, uh, Glenn Beck, so many of them. They're everywhere. As soon as they start talking about means other than peaceful assembly, means other than voting, right? Uh, You got a problem. They are telling people who to focus on, where to show up. Think about it. Gretchen Whitmer. Why did they show up? The president kept, kept pointing to Michigan, right? We had seen liberate him. Michigan because he fucking tweeted liberate, <laughs> liberate Michigan. It, you know, when it was the two uh, QAnon related guys that showed up at, at a vote counting place in Philadelphia. Why? He said, go to Philadelphia. Right. Yep. And so yep. January 6th, same thing. January. Sizer Seahawk, the, the dude with the van. This guy yeah. sent up fake dude, pipe bombs. The target year? list. It's Trump's tweets, right? Like everybody knows where that came from. So it doesn't take advanced science to figure that out. We can we can just look back in a Twitter feed and we go up. There it is. 
Uh, all right, last question. I can't believe we've uh, been talking this uh, 30 minutes already. I love talking to you, even though I've been talking too much. You write in your uh, uh, part one of this Substack, which everybody needs to subscribe to. The link is in today's show notes. You write, taking together the January 6th charging documents and research about conspiracists and extremist groups over the past five years, the current domestic terrorism landscape, the gravest threat to American security now and in the coming years is largely shaped by three facets, ideology, structure and age. We've been talking mostly about ideology, but I just want to ask you about age. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. Um, can you just break that down for me? Yeah. So the inverse is the organization structure and age. The older they are and the more structured they are, the more you'll see them teeter on what is protected free speech and try and mute violence of the younger folks. Separately, though, in the online space, the young folks have no barrier to pursuing violence. They're far more violent. Uh, they're exposed to it. They're encouraged by their peers. Yeah, you know, anonymous peers, but oftentimes like minded peers in the online space. And there's no veterans. There's no senior people. There's no buffer between them and their plots and their ideas. Actually, if you went into a lot of the militia groups, if they were to design a plot like that Wolverine militia group, it's pretty devastating, right? Like they've got capability and guns and they know how to build bombs and all of these sorts of things. But that is less frequent. What you tend to see is the groups like to keep their status. They like to do the talk. They like to do the demonstrations. Um, so they actually kind of mute some of the younger folks. That's why I'm worried about splinters in the coming months mm. is when you have a more capable splinter that's younger they're, in my mind, going to be more likely to pursue violence. And when they do, they'll be more effective. And I think you saw that more effective from like a negative violence perspective. I think you saw that in the uh, uh, DNI assessment last week. They actually said most dangerous is militia uh, extremists, because if they do decide to execute violence, they actually have guns. They have access to targets. They have skills. They've got training. They know how to do it. Um, and you, you're a veteran, but a lot of I mean, that that's a huge issue, too. If you have the training yeah. Uh, and so, to some extent, an impetus. Um, uh, I, I said this last question. I just have to ask you this. Washington Post reported today that uh, 19 people from one area in Texas near Dallas have been charged so far with their roles in the January 6 riots. We mostly talk about and you mostly look at the online space or at least a lot. That's weird, isn't it? That the, they're actually from the same goddamn neighborhood and they all went to. Uh, <laughs> did they did they uh, did they get together at a potluck and plan going to D.C., a field trip to raid the Capitol? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, I, look at that area in Texas there. There's another town called Colleyville. And so it's interesting. There are a few collectives there that are, again, uh, talking about exiting the United States, like Texas exit kind of stuff again. But this time it was Americans. Last time it was kind of a Russian foil back in 2016. Um, they're highly organized. They have get togethers. They plan it on Facebook. It's not hidden. Um, and if you think about it, just logistically, it's easier to get a lot of people together from one place to do it than a bunch of individuals from all over the country to like show up. So, you know, this is where the offline and online worlds come together. So coordination planning. And when we followed extremists around the world, it was a very similar pattern. Once one person's in, if they have a collective, a lot of people jump in. What was the QAnon thing? Uh, where we go, one, we go all. Well, 10, it sounds like where where one went, 19 followed or 18 followed, whatever it was in Texas there. Let me check my tattoo for the QAnon. <laughs> uh, uh, Clint, I didn't get to enough uh, solutions here today. I like to, to end on something positive, but I know you got to go. I really appreciate uh, you joining me. Everybody should subscribe to Clint Watts on Substack. The link is in the show notes. Of course, follow him on Twitter. And uh, keep up the good work. Uh, knowing that you're doing it makes me feel a little safer in my shed. Thanks, Pete. And uh, for my subterranean bunker, uh, <laughs> I salute you. Thank you very much, sir. Stand up. There he goes. Clint Watts. Subscribe to his Substack. That'll be a big deal. Mention that you heard him here on the Twitter. That would be a big deal. At Selected Wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, national security expert Clint Watts. And... Latasha Brown, so great to have her on the show for the first time. Really, really great conversations today. Thank you for some more supporting the podcast. If you haven't signed up for a paid subscription yet, what are you waiting for? Put that stimulus cash to good use and subscribe to Stand Up with Pete Dominic. Go to patreon.com slash Pete Dominic or just go to the paid subscription link in every day's show notes. Become part of our community and I hope to see you at our next hangout. If you do, subscribe now 
And join us every Thursday night at 8 p.m. for a virtual hang where we often have special guests. And sometimes that special guest is you. What am I talking about? All right, time to go to bed and put this baby up on the Internet so you can listen to it in the morning, subscribe to it, and give a rating if you haven't already. That's it for me. I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you for your support. No, you're never alone if you're part of the stand-up community. And singer-songwriter John Carroll, take us out, baby. Stand off ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sin, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know. It's his time to know. To make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up You got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up stand oh, up you got to stand up oh, come on just stand up everybody got to stand up in the darkest hour stand up people got the power stand up come on come on come on come on come on come on And here now, my old friend John Oliver on HBO's Last Week Tonight with an amazing anti-plastic rant. Thanks to Kim in Iowa for mentioning this to me first. Everybody knows I hate plastic. Here's just an excerpt of a longer monologue from the great John Oliver. Since then, much of our waste has been left to either pile up in domestic recycling plants with no one to buy it or shipped out to other countries in Asia where it can get dropped into landfills like this one in Malaysia. Look at how big this is. Just take a look. Look how far it goes. This is just one dump. One dump. A vast field of plastic, two stories high. Let's see if we can look on the back here. Marysville, Ohio. This is from Italy. Pennsylvania, New York. Look, Walmart bag. Yeah, a lot of our plastic just ends up sitting in giant landfills on the other side of the world. So I guess Katy Perry's question, do you ever feel like a plastic bag drifting through the wind wanting to start again, should really be, do you ever feel like a plastic warm-up bag drowning in two stories of society's unmitigated filth? And since you're asking, yeah, Katy, I do all the time. <laughs> and the problem is, those countries don't necessarily have the capabilities to deal with their own plastic waste, let alone millions of tons of ours, which can have serious consequences for the health and safety of people who live there. In Malaysia, some operations are illegally incinerating lots of plastic waste. And just listen to this community activist describing what it's like to live nearby. The air pollution become very serious in my village. The burning cause a lot of a respiratory disease problem to our people, especially our children. And our elderly who has uh, this uh, problem of uh, repeating asthma, repeating coughing also. That's terrible. 
And I have to say, there is just no way that the people responsible for burning that waste don't know the fumes are toxic. When you smell burning plastic, you don't think, ooh, ooh, that smells great. Is someone baking cookies? You think, my nose seems to be dying and it's taking my brain down with it. <laughs> John Oliver watched the whole thing on uh, last week tonight on HBO. Thank you very much for listening today. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Love you. Goodbye.